In the last module, we looked at surface water. What we're going to concentrate on this one is groundwater. Um, surface water can sink into the ground, or precipitation can sink into the ground and enter what we call aquifers. Um, an aquifer is either permeable rock, which means it allows water to flow through, or sediments that allow water to flow. Um, as the water flows through, it is naturally filtrated. So that's why if you have well water, the water is pumped directly from the ground into your home and it does not need to be treated. Um, as the water seeps through the ground, once it reaches either an impermeable clay soil or a rock that is impermeable, it starts to move laterally. And you can see that um, in this diagram here that groundwater too can run towards a lake or run towards the ocean. All right, so that area that's completely uh, saturated or all the pore space is filled with water, uh, that's your aquifer. The top uh, boundary of the aquifer is the water table. Uh, water table can rise and fall. If you have a wet season, your water table is going to be higher. If you experience drought or you have a lot of people that are using the water or a lot of irrigation, then your water table can drop. When we withdraw groundwater, um, basically what we're doing is we are uh, digging a hole and putting a pipe and a pump down to withdraw water from that aquifer. Aquifers are considered renewable as long as we aren't using the water faster than it's being recharged or, or um, as long as it's not becoming contaminated. About one-fourth of the world's population depends on groundwater from aquifers for their drinking water. The bad news with that is, is that what we're seeing um, with the use of groundwater for irrigation is that the water tables are falling because we are using that water much faster than it can be recharged. A lot of the areas where we depend on irrigation are areas that don't get a lot of rainfall. So we don't have the water to recharge that aquifer. The advantages to withdrawing groundwater as opposed to surface water is that you can remove it as it's needed. Um, it's going to be there year round. You're not going to have evaporation in the summer like you would from a reservoir. Um, usually it's less expensive because you don't have a big dam project that you're building on a river to create a reservoir. There's no upkeep. You're basically just digging a well that pumps the water out. The disadvantages are, once again, the lowering of the water table and depleting that aquifer. Uh, when an aquifer becomes depleted, uh, the pore space is empty, the ground can subside. Uh, what you see in this diagram here, um, this is San Joaquin Valley in California. The elevation of the surface of the land used to be um, up here and then over time the land has subsided. So this is from 1925 to 1975 how much the elevation of the land has dropped. Here is a sinkhole where a lot of the water has been withdrawn for irrigation um, and the ground just collapsed into that aquifer. Another thing that we see is the intrusion of salt water. Um, if the water table is lower near the coast then that salt water can enter the aquifer. Uh, chemical contamination. Once groundwater is contaminated, there's not much we can do uh, to remedy that situation. Reduce steam f stream flow. Um, when groundwater reaches the surface, uh, that creates springs, which feed some of our streams. If we're lowering that water table, then we're going to see less water in our streams as well. So what can we do to prevent uh, groundwater depletion? Well, if we can control population growth, well, then we won't have the dependence in the future on groundwater that we do now. If we would be careful about the types of crops that we plant in dry areas, cotton and sugarcane are two very water-intensive crops, which is why they both grow well in the southeast United States, because we have plenty of water. Um, so we need to avoid using those in dry areas that would depend on irrigation. Coming up with ways to irrigate that use less water. Um, instead of using traditional spray irrigation, if we use drip irrigation right near the roots, then we're reducing the amount of water that's evaporated. If we look at where the water resources are compared to world's population, you can see it's not balanced. Um, we're okay. Um, we've got, in North and Central America, we have 15% of the world's 
water resources and only 7.3 percent of the population. Whereas when you look at Africa and Asia, where most of our world's population growth is occurring, they have um, a smaller percentage of the world's water supply compared to their population. Um, some of the problems with world's water are directly related to pollution, both surface and groundwater supplies. Um, sometimes water supplies are used as sewers or dumps when they don't have any services in place. Runoff uh, from cities, from factories, from farms can infiltrate through the ground or can run off into streams and rivers. And then as we saw from that diagram, not all the fresh water is on Earth is where it needs to be. It's not evenly distributed. Um, there are areas where people have to travel miles each day um, just to get the water that they need, either um, because they're in a dry season, they're experiencing drought, or they just don't live near an access. So a lot of what we take for granted, that you can just turn on your sink and water comes out, they don't have in many of our less economically developed countries. They have to actually go to the well and withdraw the water. Some other causes of water scarcity, we've got drought, um, which is where you have usually high evaporation and low precipitation, so that can be a result of higher temperatures than normal. If you're in a dry climate, you're already going to have lower amounts of uh, precipitation. And then desiccation is drying of the soil when either we remove the vegetation uh, through deforestation or overgrazing. That exposes the soil, causing it to dry out. As more and more people are relying on limited amounts of runoff, that creates water stress. And another thing that we're seeing is our lakes and rivers are shrinking because we're removing that water for irrigation. We're diverting it to other areas, using it for industry. So as a result of um, our water scarcity in areas, about one-sixth of the people on Earth don't have enough access to fresh water. When we think about 7 billion people, one-sixth of 7 billion, that's a pretty significant number. There are ways that we can increase our water supply. Uh, we can build a dam. Now that might create problems downstream, but that can create water in an area that needs it. We can bring in water from elsewhere. We'll look at a case study of diverting water. We can withdraw groundwater or convert salt water to fresh water using desalinization, which is expensive, but um, is done in certain parts of the world. If you can look at um, the map here at the top, you can see um, in the southeast United States, we're lucky we've got very little water scarcity problems. We do see problems in the southwest uh, with physical water scarcity and approaching physical water scarcity. But if you look at Africa and Asia, where most of the people on Earth live, you really see where those problems um, are arising. Importing food. Um, from areas that have rainfall. Um, it's not going to do you much good to import food from an area that also uses heavy irrigation, but that can help cut down on um, the amount of irrigations that are used in drier areas. All right, so desalinization I mentioned is a, a way to increase our usable water. Um, and this is one of the things that they're doing in Saudi Arabia. They have 27 desalination plants, and so 70% of their water originates as salt water. Um, so what it does is they take either salt water from the ocean or brackish water, which is a mix of fresh and salt water, usually at the mouth of the river, and they remove the dissolved salt. So there's several different ways they can do it. They can distill it, which is you, you heat it to a high enough temperature, the water evaporates. Um, the salt's left behind, and they condense evaporated water into fresh water. Or reverse osmosis, where it's pumped through a filter or membrane um, that allows the water molecules through, but the dissolved salts are too large. Now, the disadvantages, um, it is very expensive, and then you also have wastewater, which is brine, um, very salty water, and the leftover minerals, uh, when the water was evaporated, you've got to find ways to dispose of those. One of the 
biggest reasons experts think that we are wasting water is because we don't charge enough for it. If we charge more for water, people would use less. If we could decrease some of the subsidies that the government pays out to keep these water prices artificially low, that would decrease the amount of water that's wasted. Um, I mentioned coming up with better irrigation techniques. Currently when, with spray irrigation, most of that evaporates. Only 40% of it actually reaches crops. Um, if we use gravity flow, which um, if you set your rows so they go downhill and allow the water to flow between the rows, um, usually there's an aqueduct system that brings water from a nearby river. Um, center pivot irrigation, uh, if you've ever flown over the Midwest and looked down you might have seen some cropland that just look like circles. Um, basically it, it pivots around a center, uh, it's very low to the ground so it keeps the water from uh, evaporating. The most efficient is drip irrigation, that's putting the soaker hoses right at the roots of the plants. Um, so gravity flow, once again 60 to 80 percent efficient, drip irrigation 90 to 95 and this is a closer look at center pivot um, which usually is around 80 percent efficient. In homes, ways that we can reduce water waste. Um, if we would redesign our manufacturing processes, right now most of them depend on using water as a coolant. Um, if we're careful about what we grow, what types of vegetation in our arid or dry regions, not trying to have a green grass lawn um, in an area uh, like in somewhere in the middle of Arizona that's not going to get very much rain. Having water ordinances that limit the amount of water people can use if you're experiencing a drought. Um, and then being careful of the types of appliances you get. Uh, front loading washers use less water than the top loading washers. Uh, and they also have an added benefit. They're not agitating your clothes so they're um, a little bit better on your clothes. We're using gray water. Gray water um, is, for example, let's say you're going to take a shower in the morning, you turn on the shower, it's cold, you wait a few minutes to get in before it's hot. If you would just put a bucket in the bottom of your shower and use that to water your plants or flush your toilet, then that cuts down on gallons of water that's wasted. And then raising the price of water um, can also help reduce waste.